of the um, Mort subcommittee meeting. Um, a couple of ground rules before we start this meeting. Um, we have concurred that, that uh, because of time constraints and the number of people in the audience, to limit your, your comments and observations to three minutes. Um, welcome. Um, I certainly want your input as Glenn Kirstein, the chairman of this committee. Um, it's been a long time. We've talked about having a public comment period. Um, and I, and um, I certainly welcome you here this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to, us to introduce ourselves. And perhaps we can start with Mike. And as you introduce yourself, could you, could you um, also specify what subcommittee you participated in? Yes, absolutely. It's Mike Ballancourt. I've participated in the uh, facilities subcommittee as well as the, uh, as well as the li library subcommittee, and I live on Stony Brook Road. My name is Dick Bauman, and I've participated in the, uh, or on the general government uh, subcommittee and on the public works subcommittee. I live uh, on Cross Hill Road. I'm Penny Jordan, and I participated on the public safety as well as the public works uh, subcommittees. And I'm a member of the town council, and I live on Fowler Road. I'm David Sherman. I live on Hunts Point Road. I'm on the town council, and I served on the general government subcommittee and the revenue subcommittee. I'm Glenn Kirstein. Um, I live on Mitchell Road. Um, I have the dubious distinction of being the chairman of this committee. I also served on the Facilities Committee and the Revenue Subcommittee. My name is Mary Ann Lynch, and I live at Old Colony Lane, and I served on the Public Works and the Library Committees. My name is Bill DeSena. I live at Wainwright Drive, and I served on the Public Service and the General Government Committees, Subcommittees. I'm Kim Thompson. I live at Six Pine Ridge Road. I was on the Revenue Committee and the Public Safety Committee. Hi, I'm Jean Goodmarvin. I served on the Facilities Committee and the Library and Community Services Committee, and I live on Cranbrook Drive. Thank you. There has been some, perhaps, misunderstanding as to the purpose of this committee and the charge that we received from the Town Council. I'd like to take just a minute and a half of your time and, and have Dave um, read our original charge. Okay, the uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council formed the Cape Elizabeth Municipal Operations Review Committee, which is to be a temporary advisory ad hoc committee. The purpose of the committee is to review Cape Elizabeth Municipal Operations to determine their efficiency and effectiveness. This charge was written broadly in order to provide independence to the committee in their review and in their deliberations. The committee shall familiarize itself with the council, town manager, Charter of the Town of Cape Elizabeth with the town's organizational structure, with main statutes determining municipal responsibilities, with municipal budgets, and with data that provides opportunity for benchmarking services and costs. The committee shall include opportunities for public participation in its deliberations in order to evaluate citizens' views of current services and possible changes in services, and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, municipal staff will be given an opportunity by the committee to present data and to answer committee inquiries. The committee shall not evaluate the performance of individual employees. Uh, the committee may identify alternative delivery methods of municipal services and or municipal services to be added, modified, or eliminated. The committee may examine how services are paid for. The committee shall not review health insurance benefits provided to municipal and school employees as that charge was a responsibility assigned to another committee. Uh, the committee shall submit a report to the town council by no later than July 1, 2010, and the committee will be retired on December 31, 2010. And it goes on to explain the membership of the committee. Uh, and finally, with regard to budget, there was no budget provided for this committee. If the committee identifies needed resources, the town manager shall forward any financial request to the town council. So tonight, as one of our charges, we are uh, holding this hearing to provide people with an opportunity to give us their input. 
Thank you. Now we welcome your public comment. As you come to the podium, uh, would be you please identify yourself and your address? And if I could just jump in, uh, it's helpful if we can form a queue of at least three or four people so we don't have a lot of downtime as we're waiting for the next person to speak. In addition, some uh, issues are near and dear to certain people's hearts. And you, you, somebody could say something that you feel like applauding, uh, but I would ask that audience members refrain from doing that because that may intimidate others who have a differing viewpoint from getting up and speaking. Uh, no personal attacks, of course, um, but again, we are interested in your input. So please, uh, if somebody's willing to be the first to go, uh, and then we could, if we could have a queue, we can then move this along. very much for this opportunity uh, for input. I am Nancy Marshall. I live at 10 Wildwood Drive. Um, I am a five-year member of the Thomas Memorial Library Board of Trustees, and I also chaired the Library Study Committee, which was created by the Town Council to look at the operations, services, and facilities of the Thomas Memorial Library. It's from those perspectives that I will make my comments, and I would like to make them regarding the library portion of the Culture Community Services Subcommittee report and its suggestions, if that is agreeable to everyone. Okay. The first question that was raised by the subcommittee is whether or not it would make sense to have the library become regional or county-based, and perhaps towns could join in a consortium. Well, there certainly is a lot of precedent in the rest of the country for regional and county-based library services, not so actually in Maine. But the library is, is actually in a very large statewide consortium. It's known as Minerva. It is an interlibrary loan system, and this past year, over 32,000 interlibrary loans were done by the uh, Cape Elizabeth Library. Half of them, a little more than half, were borrowed from other libraries, and the remaining of those 32,000 were loaned to other libraries, and it's a very even reciprocity, which is the hallmark of effective and efficient library cooperation. But I would also like to state that from experience of my own putting together library cooperatives, consortia, and mergers, it is a very complicated and difficult process. It can be done, and it has been done, on both small and large scale throughout the country, but it takes years of negotiation and compromise to make it happen, to make it work, and most importantly, to make it survive. At last, it's not always money that is saved either, but greater access to your community and its resources. The second large topic brought up by the committee is that of whether there needs to be a public library and three library media centers in the schools being on the same campus and in close proximity to each other. This is not a new topic. It has come up many times, and the Library Study Committee looked at that very carefully. We prepared a brief summary of the different and often incompatible missions, staffing needs, state accreditation versus certification requirements, access and hours, current space demands and inadequacies, um, and other implications. We prepared a handout for the town council workshop in February, and I'm not going to go through it, but I'm going to send them around so that you can each have a copy. And I think that um, you will see by looking at those that it's, it's not a simple matter of every spelling library, L-I-B-R-A-R-Y, library, L -I -B -R -A -R -Y, does not necessarily mean that all libraries are the same, have the same missions. 
How much? Who's keeping time? Uh, you're running close. Oh, I'm running close. Okay. <laughs> well, what I would like to do then is take the opportunity to send you an email on my other um, my other comments. Um, but just one more thing, and that is the suggestion that the library is 10 hours over is open 10 hours over the. Um, requirement by the state. That is true. I see that as quite a positive, actually. You could save, if you took 10 hours off of the library in a year, $36,000. You could also save a lot more if you closed the library entirely. But I don't think either of those options would serve the town of Cape Elizabeth and its needs and the use to which its patrons use the library. Thank you, and I will send you some more information. Thank you so much. Um, I have received, as chairman of the committee, um, perhaps eight or ten emails with comments um, that the committee has received copies of. So we do welcome your written comment as well as your, your oral comments. Any other comments? Fred Prince, Two Rocky Hill Road, Cape Elizabeth, since 1966. I consider it a failure of management to fire people. Let's start there. Number one, change the health care. Monday night I showed, uh, the last four months I've been showing how you can save costs there. Only got three minutes. Number two, cost ten to $15,000 to maintain a file cabinet. I bet we have over 100 here in the state, in, in this town. Number three, but uh, UPS, when gas hit $4 a gallon, we worked all their routes so that every truck turned right as many times as possible. Now, there's no application here, but it does. Because I've run a survey on plowing. And I've asked people, how many times the plow come down your street? Some was one, some was two, some was three. I think we can save some money there. Number four, Alaska and I think Michigan. Wall Street Journal, and I was uh, getting out of the defined benefit contribution plans because those plans, when the market goes down, require the states to put in a lot more money, which the states don't have, and go to a 401k plan. Number five, police cars. We are a, sta we are a town that's about, what, 10, 12 miles long by three, four, five miles wide. Maybe we should be thinking about using the Prius. There's only one road in our town where you can go 80 miles an hour. All the rest are slow roads. Maybe we should use cars where we look at not the highway mileage, 32 miles, but the local mileage. I think there's a lot of places we can save and we can keep our people. But we have to start acting now. Thank you. Sir, sir I, didn't, I didn't hear your number two point, your second point. Number two. Filing the cabinet. file cabinet. And I didn't. I, what? The ten to fifteen thousand dollars to maintain a file cabinet. Oh. Yeah. And I, uh, I did a Google search on file cabinets, <laughs> and it turns out, and I couldn't get back that page the second time. It's interesting. So I got the first time. It's between, uh, it costs between ten and fifteen thousand dollars to maintain a file cabinet. I'll give you a search that's done by Weiss Research. You have to look at that because they say it's a lower number. But then when you go into the number, it's $20 every time someone wants to go in and pull out a file. It's $120 every time a file is lost, and 30% of the files are lost most of the time. I also like to bring more revenue up, just for this group. I got my email from the Beast to Beacon. $35. My God, I ran into a person who said he pays $50 plus to do a 10K. That costs us nothing. We raise it to $75, the Ford is off a thing. There's $100,000. Thank you. Can you con conclude the public hearing? Yeah. Are there any? Is there anybody else? Yeah. Okay. This not be too big, much of a hurry. I'm uh, Tom Dunham. I'm at um, 12 Becky's Cove Lane. 
<clears throat> and um, I want to thank the opportunity to speak before you. <clears throat> First of all, um, I have been well aware of the severe financial impact this recession has had on our <clears throat> businesses throughout the state of Maine. It started about three years ago and certainly will linger for years to come as it will be very slow, a very slow recover, recovery in the state of Maine. This past week, <clears throat> my partner and I just toured a plant down in, uh, in Brunswick and we lost 600 jobs. <clears throat> Those jobs are going down to Mexico. <clears throat> if you just look over the past three years and the <clears throat> businesses that we've lost in the state, state of Maine, the manufacturing firms are not coming back, they're gone. Dominican Republic, Mexico, elsewhere. And it's very difficult, <clears throat> almost impossible to find a replacement. It's taken us three years in Standish with a GTE plant. That's 125,000 square feet. At one time they had 1,000 employees there. So that <clears throat> it's been vacant for three years without <clears throat> a replacement. Um, and you can get out of Wells and Spencer Press uh, sold to Donnelly. Donnelly closed a year ago. There's been <clears throat> it's it's 400,000 square feet, 10 acres in area. Um, no one's taken it yet. It's <clears throat> it's very very serious and it impacts us all. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's an ideal in industrial industrial real estate. <clears throat> I do it throughout the state, and I know how difficult it is everywhere. Therefore, <clears throat> it is my belief that this is a long-term financial crisis facing us all. And the quicker we adjust to the new paradigm, the better off our families, friends, and businesses will be. And obviously that includes municipal, state, and federal government. Due to my business background, I have spoken to the assessors in Scarborough and South Portland. By the way, South Portland merged with um, Westbrook several years ago. So the consolidation move <clears throat> has occurred. And, and I would like to propose the following. that. Um, we, and I, and I have sp spoken to um, <clears throat> the assessor in Scarborough as well as South Portland. And I think it would be very easy and, uh, to facilitate a consolidation of the, these four communities. And <clears throat> um, if you look at the assessors in the other two towns, um, they're <clears throat> at an age, not that they haven't retired yet, but they, I think the transition will be coming in the next five years. And then I look at my own assessor here in our town, who I think is very capable, young, <clears throat> and he could be groomed to take over and be the head <clears throat> assessor for all the communities over the next, say, five years. <clears throat> and um, I, and <clears throat> the towns, the capability of our assessor here certainly has the ability to um, oversee the, um, um, the larger com communities, even though they're diverse in uh, real estate. Um, one in short, Tom. One minute. Well, the other suggestion I have is I know there's discussions uh, within the um, planning department and uh, buildings codes and uh, assessors to uh, have someone, a uh, person oversee the uh, two staff people. I run a very small company, and I don't. I don't think that's necessary at all. I, the, when you have a small business, and everyone pitches in together, and I don't think it's necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Francis Haywood. I own the property across the street, one two two one Shore Road. Um, I was in the meeting prior when um, Mike McGovern kind of jokingly, and I appreciated the joke, spoke about the number of times the town council has uh, requested towns, hall, people, you know, in one department or another to apply for grants. And then when we receive the grant, it's not accepted. And um, I have seen that many times. The genesis of that, I think, is one of the the problems in the way business is being done in this town. Uh, I think there are small interest groups, you know, 20, 30 people that have an interest in this area or that area, and they form a group, uh, sometimes, um, I think maybe many times, with a lot of nourishment and um, support from different people in the town hall. 
and they work on something and then uh, the request a grant application be followed through. The town council does that and the grant is uh, given. And then it's at that point that the broad citizenry becomes aware. I think that's exactly what happened with the traffic light. All of a sudden the people are thinking, what? You know, we're gonna spend what for what? And I think that honestly, um, there are too often that people, many, many people in town I think have the feeling that way too much happens under the radar before it becomes really known to the broad citizenry. That's not, not known to anybody. People are busy living their lives, keeping body and soul together, and certainly in these dire economic times, they just do not have time to follow every you know subcommittee and committee and standing group and commission and um, et cetera, of which there seem to be literally hundreds in this town. Um, so I, I had particular interest in the Shore Road Path Committee and watched how that all happened. Um, for example, our town allocated, I believe it was $35,000. And then we had our town planner, two more minutes, okay. Our town planner, I, I know, spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on that project in various meetings, meeting with m many, many people on the shore road. None of that cost was allocated. That had to be at least another $30,000. I think we should account for that. Um, I think we should account for that money. Uh, and I think as far as I'm concerned, the, um, a town that has essentially no development going on really does not need a full-time town planner. Um, and my recommendation for your committee to reduce some of this administrative um, overhead that we have would be to recommend to the town council, which I think we've had extremely ambitious town councils in the past several years, which have explored many, many expensive projects. I think you should recommend to the town council that there be a period of, let's say, 30 days or something like that, that they could, there could be signature you know, papers around, and they need to have a majority of the voters of Cape Elizabeth sign that they're interested in X project or Y project before the town council you know, authorizes a study for the $50,000, $20,000, et cetera, so that you know something has really broad support before we spend a lot of money on it. Thank I think that would be a good recommendation. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> if I could just again re re reiterate the need for folks to line up so that we can keep the, the hearing going forward um, because uh, we're ending up with some downtime. So thanks. My name is Dave Griffin, uh, Channel View Road. <coughs> uh, I thank you for an opportunity to speak tonight. I'll try to be real brief. I have only one subject I want to talk about, but I also want to say that I think that you people have started um, some thinking in town, and I hope it continues. Um, I attended a couple of your meetings. Uh, last meeting I attended, there was a motion that was made, and I want to bring it up because I think it, I may not word it as it was worded, but I think it's important to consider. There was a motion made that, um, they would, that uh, the, citizen, the person that made it said that they would like to see a, a private firm come in and do some of the investigation and carry on this issue. Um, I know it's still in front of you people and you haven't uh, ruled on it, but I think it's important for the people to know in town that not all of us as citizens are professional in a field that, um, that a private firm can come in and do some of the studies. Um, they'd be, they'd be non-biased, and uh, I think some of the, uh, the uh, things that would be pointed up may not be pointed necessarily by you people. So I hope that you will reconsider that motion uh, before you finish up your work that you would uh, carry through on that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good evening. My name is Charlie Kennedy. I live at 36 Thrasher Road. Um, during the day, I work at a, one of the regional banks here in town. And uh, my, 
My fun job really is I volunteer here with Cape Elizabeth. I'm currently the captain of the fire police and the town's emergency management director. And I will, uh, right up front, um, my focus is really on the public safety report. And I will, I understand that there's a new report that must have appeared today. Because uh, when I looked on the website last night, there was, there was a different version. But my, my question is, and I guess it's an overarching question, um, is there hasn't been a discussion or, a, from what I could see, a review of what the indicators are that we've really got a, a problem in the in municipal government here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, reports that I've heard, and I'm going back when the governor first handed down the uh, school consolidation directive, if you will, um, that Cape Elizabeth was exempted from that because the, the community was well run, school department was well run, municipal government, school department shared services. And I think we were one of a very few communities in the state that really were exempted from that. So, so and I, I was also uh, privy to a report and it's, it's somewhat dated now, but that compared public safety costs in Cape Elizabeth to other towns in Cumberland County, Cape Elizabeth was right at the bottom, bottom two or three out of probably 10 or 15 towns. And I guess my concern is, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the uh, earlier version of the report, but there were some fairly, what I would call, significant um, suggestions and somewhat really infrastructure changes and I, I guess I'm, I'm confused as to why we feel the need to take that drastic of an action when we're already doing, on a statewide basis, a very good job. I mean, I've, I've had the experience of working closely with Michael and Peter and, and Neil, and I know they're very concerned about the budget. They're very concerned about the money that's being spent and do a great job maintaining it. So, uh, you know, I throw that out as a question um, more than anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could uh, respond, um, it, and just speaking for myself, Charlie, um, the, the reports that are on the website were reports done by um, subcommittees. We're here tonight to hear all of the comments that people have to make. Um, not all of us on the committee agreed with that first draft, and I'm sure I, for one, was glad that it was, um, uh, I guess, uh, changed today. And I'd just like to point out, I don't think that um, consideration was given to the benchmarks that have been done, which show, for instance, that fire and rescue costs per capita in South Portland are $169 per capita, and in Cape Elizabeth, $45 per capita. Um, I don't think that people were looking at the um, police costs in South Portland, which are 130 dollars per capita and in Cape Elizabeth $107. I don't think people were looking at the fact that um, if you're buying um, homeowners um, liability insurance, ta the town of Cape Elizabeth has a very good rating. So it's not just a question of the cost of the service but the value of the service and I don't think that that was considered in that earlier report. Thank you. And I thank you for your service. Lim, um, I'm. Uh, I want to just respond. Uh, the I was a chairman of the Public Safety Committee, and we did do a redraft. Uh, we we backed our committee report up to more closely align with where the other committee reports were coming in. Uh, we and we did that for a number of different reasons. One of the reasons I think. Uh, we ended up with, with the kind of report that prompted the kind of reaction that we got is based on the approach that we could utilize in finding out what we needed to find out about fire, rescue, public safety. Uh, you can't really get any further, any deeper than depart, uh, visiting with the department heads. Uh, when we had our police uh, meetings, we did have a few officers that typically participated, but the process that exists today with, with the right to know law, um, if we wanted to, if two of our committee members wanted to speak to anybody in any one of those departments, it would have to be a public meeting. Uh, one of the reasons we're, we're backing this up is we feel like there is a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, when, when the, and I guess one of the things that, that's good about our public safety uh, report that first came out is it surely prompted a lot more feedback 
that I wasn't, you know, I was, I was in a position to start getting some feedback that I hadn't received. And uh, especially in the area of our volunteer fire department, some very good friends of mine in this town uh, actually enlightened me uh, on a number of those issues that helped me in uh, visiting again with my subcommittee and, and coming back, bringing that back and suggesting we get more in line with where all the other subcommittees were and that's in this fuzzy kind of a regionalization, sharing of services, leasing uh, equipment, kind of an approach that uh, I'm not sure that's what the original intent of the town council was for us to come back with this fuzzy recommendation but that's kind of where we're ending up being. Uh, that's one of the reasons why in this revised report that we're doing is we're strongly recommending that the town spend the money to bring in some outside experts that do have the expertise that can study this and can come up with some recommendations. I think you can just look at what's happened in Portland and the kind of savings they've been able to come up with with, with a very small expenditure, looks with 40,000 expenditure at two and a half million dollars in potential savings. If we don't get a multiple of, of a forty or fifty thousand dollar consulting fee back, and, they, and there's absolutely nothing in this town that can be improved upon, and that we really are so fabulous as we think, well, I think them coming back and telling us that it probably be well worth the expenditure. Tim. But uh, that's that's kind of a, a response to why we we did come back with that subcommittee change. Thank you, Tim. Folks, it, what, what this. What this exchange emphasizes, I think, is that things are still very much under discussion with this committee. Therefore, all the more reason for your public comment and your thoughts. It's, it's helpful. Precisely. I, hear, I was queued up and everything. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Ruth Ann Haley. I live on 49 Brentwood Road. I have no prepared remarks, but I was at the committee last week and earlier at the um, discussion tonight and I think that you've sort of proven the need for an outside consultant that you have already identified the fact that you need a lot more information you have only scratched the surface and there are a lot more discussions that need to happen if you're going to consolidate there are contractual issues there's private public if you're talking about the library there's there's a lot of information and there are also camps all over town and underground emails and all kinds of stuff that goes on. And it's not good or bad, it's just that people that think alike share information and want support and that's why some of us are here tonight. But I think it supports the need to finally have an external evaluator to come in and sort of squelch all of the rumors and all of the camps and all of the you know, posturing, and finally just have someone come in. We've, we've, we've had all kinds of surveys on intersections and, you know, walkways and traffic studies. I think that this, this, this committee tonight deserves an, an, an external evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. David will once again urge you to form up in a queue. Or we can all just go home. <laughs> My name is Helen Mainville. I live in uh, Hopstone at 29 Merrimack. Uh, I went to your earlier meeting this evening and I would like to uh, just address the public safety subcommittee report. Um, in the report, the new report, it states that from your conversations with the fire and police chief, um, the subcommittee has thinks that there are strong opportunities exist for further uh, leasing, hiring, sharing, regionalization of services um, in the police and rescue and fire departments. The opportunity to save on vehicle purchases, purchasing purchase personnel, and other stuff clearly exists. Um, about a year and a half ago, the town manager had a meeting with all of the volunteer services, fire, uh, wet team, rescue, and um, the fire police. And in that meeting, he told us that, you know, 
as, uh, by the way, I am a volunteer member of the rescue. In that meeting, he told us that we as volunteer services in the town of Cape Elizabeth actually save the town three and a half million dollars a year, which I think is sort of a, an astronomical number. Um, and to think that we would now say to all of those volunteers, well, you know, no, you need to be part of some other company or some sort of paid company. South Portland, for instance, is a paid company. And I think if we regionalize, regionalize, regionalize our services with them and they, you know, come in and take over some of our fire or our uh, rescue services, they are paid. They're paid on a per diem basis and they're not going to do this. I mean, it's going to cost the town something to have them come in and share with us. I don't think they will share for nothing. Anyway, it also is in here, it says that, you know, that, that the, the, the committee realizes that we do have a lot of volunteers and that we are supposedly the envy of the state. Well, that's wonderful and care should be taken to protect at all costs the asset that we have with the, with, the, with, with the volunteers that we do have. And I'm not sure that the volunteer, the level of volunteers that we have in the town would be maintained if we were to Regional, regionalize some of these services. Um, one of the areas, it says, for instance, in the area of rescue, the challenge of staffing all calls with a paramedic seems to provide the department with a challenge from time to time. All calls don't need a paramedic. We're eight miles from the hospital. Um, if, a, if a child stuffs a pee up his nose and the mother calls us, we really don't need a paramedic for that. You know, the state gives us license or issues license for basics intermediates and paramedics. So I guess they think that there's, but not all calls do need a paramedic. Otherwise we wouldn't have basics, we wouldn't need basics and intermediates. And I do hope that you push this out to have somebody come in professionally and look at the whole thing, the bigger picture, get more facts. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm Chuck Wilson. I live at Mitchell Road. <coughs> Been in the town for since 1963 as a resident and an active participant in a variety of things in the town. Uh, most notably, probably, uh, was that I was fire chief and deputy fire chief back when it was still volunteer. Uh, 27 years on the fire department, and that's what I'm really here to talk about. Uh, I could talk about other things too, but that one really struck me. And I'll have to say, when I read that report that was online, I was absolutely and totally flabbergasted. I, I couldn't believe what I was reading uh, because it was so inaccurate and incomplete and there were assumptions that had been made uh, that just, I don't know where they came from. Uh, and I was very concerned about that. Uh, I don't think there's any question that there are some opportunities for consolidation and working together. And particularly in the fire and rescue service and the police service, we've been doing that for years and uh, do it quite nicely through the mutual aid agreements, which means it doesn't cost us anything. As soon as you start imposing upon other communities for services that we should be providing ourselves, it's no longer mutual aid. That's going to cost. And I think that's one of the things that really jumped out at me was the, the assumption that we could get South Portland to do a lot of things and maybe not incur some costs. And if you're not going to have the savings, you may in fact have additional costs. So I, I was concerned about that. Um, I'm also, uh, I kind of had the feeling reading that report that somebody was looking at a cookie jar and that cookie jar was somebody else's cookie jar and they thought we ought to put our hand in it and get something for nothing. And I, it just isn't going to work that way. Uh, so the, the, my biggest concern is that I think that we have the capability in-house to have some ongoing discussions with department heads and you're going to have to do some negotiation to make this happen. I mean, South Portland isn't just going to say, 
okay, we're going to send a ladder truck out here every single alarm and not bill you for it. Uh, and I think we have to understand that there's, there's a balance in that process. I would urge the town, first of all, not necessarily to jump out and spend money for an outside consultant. I think you have uh, a raft of people in the community as uh, are sitting on this committee that have some capability, some knowledge, and some experience and could contribute to that. I also think you have department heads that have been looking at these very same questions for years and probably could tell you the last three times that we looked at it and we actually figured out what the cost was going to be and made a determination that it didn't make a lot of sense. Now maybe times have changed, but I think we we, we need to use those internal resources, and I, I know that the chiefs sat in on the meetings, but uh, I didn't get a very strong feeling that, that they felt as though anybody really listened to them at, at, in, in detail. So I, I would say, I, I understand that there's a new report out, I just quickly scanned it tonight, and I, I like the tone of it a lot better, uh, because the the conclusions and the assumptions went right there. It said we need to do some more study. I would support that. Uh, but I would be cautious about just hiring another consultant. The comparison to Portland, I think, is a mistake. The $40,000 I spent was on a, a budget that's probably more than the entire town and, and Cape school budget combined. So of course they're going to have some dollars. But if you're looking at a $250,000 budget, for the fire department, for example, uh, and you spend $40,000 on that, you're not going to get $40,000 back, I, I wouldn't believe. So I would just, I would urge some caution. I would understand that you have a huge group of volunteers that are doing things for a lot less than it would cost you to do it on a full-time basis and doing it equally as well, and you don't want to lose sight of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Waldeck Mainbill. I live in Hopstone, 29 Merrimack Place. I have been a member of the fire department at Engine Company Number 1 since 1972. I am also a member of the rescue. The membership at Engine Company Number 1 <coughs> is probably more heavily South Portland residents than Cape Elizabeth residents because they don't want to be members of the South Portland call companies. They like engine company number one and they, most of them are here tonight to demonstrate the trust that we have that you people will make the right decision and keep engine company number one fully staffed. Also all four of the officers who are presently in Engine company number one, live in South Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, name's Ron O'Brien. I'm the captain down at Cape Cottage Station, uh, otherwise known as the people next to the cookie jar, or the building formerly known as the cookie jar. Um, I'm a resident of South Portland. I don't even know if I have a right to be speaking up here tonight, but I'm going to anyway, unless you throw me out. Thank you for taking the uh, time. Thank you, sir. You're uh, <coughs> I've been with Engine 1 for going on 19 years as a call member down there. Uh, as well as, uh, I think I'm rounding 10 years as a public works employee for the town. Um, back in the late 90s, early 2000, when Chief McGoodrick was at the helm, we started talking about regionalization with South Portland. Uh, that was all, you know, coming down from Augusta. Uh, at that time, there was talk about moving stations together, um, and this and that, which created a lot of heartburn amongst the members down to Engine Company 1. Um, at that time, it was agreed upon that we'd, just, we'd share equipment, we'd share each other's calls. Uh, that's been working out great for the last, uh, the way time flies, I think it's been about five, six years. Uh, 
I equate it to, uh, not that I'm married or anything, so the people don't know that, but uh, <laughs> I equate it to uh, going to visit the mother-in-law. It's good to go visit or have her come visit once in a while, but to move in with her, no thank you. No thank you. But uh, you know, all that aside, uh, the, the members of Engine One uh, over the years have done a, a lot of uh, work to save this town money. Uh, as far as building maintenance and stuff like that, uh, in the past 15 years, um, I can't think of a project that hasn't involved some of the members of Engine One to save, you know, contractor costs, stuff like that, as well as uh, utilizing our own town's public works to do, which, uh, you know, it's like six, seven years ago, did a major job down there as far as replacing the floor and uh, removing the center post at the building and putting in a single door. All these things were to keep that building going so we didn't have to move. Um, you know, it, the building was built back in the 30s with war funds. You know, how much long is it going to stand up? We don't know, but we're going to try and bubble gum it together because we don't want to go anywhere. Um, I've been told by a lot of my members that if we go, then I'm going. Um, myself and uh, probably a handful of other guys uh, that live in South Portland have all been with the South Portland Call Company at one time or another. And there's a reason we're in Cape. We enjoy it. So, thank you. Thank you for your service. My name's uh, Patrick Cotter. I now live at 139 Broadway in South Portland, like Ron. However, I did grow up here in town from age four until 23, I think, at 21 Ocean House. I graduated from Cape High School. I've been on the fire department since 1996, and I've been on the rescue for about five years now. I was, I read the uh, report uh, Monday after our meeting. Um, I was a little behind everybody else, and I was very upset at the wording. Um, South Portland has a fine fire department. I'm on the finest fire department in the state. All these people here wake up in the middle of the night. Um, a lot of us left our families a couple weeks ago, no power. But we came here, a lot of us from South Portland, especially an Engine One company, to run a variety of calls. You name it, we ran it. I guess, I guess what my consideration is, is closing, especially closing down Engine 1, I don't think it's going to save the town any money. You have to remember a few things about Willard. One of the things that most people do not realize, where the fire station is in Willard Square is not owned by the city of South Portland. It is owned by the fire company of Willard. You cannot admit domain a building to make it a fire station that's already a fire station. It will not hold up in court. So keep that in mind. That building needs to put another two trucks down there would need major renovations. You could probably tear down engine one station where it sits right now and build us a brand new station for less by the time you add in everything that you need to add in there. I would also like to say something about the police department. One thing you have to remember, because we are a volunteer rescue organization, our police officers are one of the few police departments that everyone must be an EMT. It's a requirement of the job. Because of that, our times are some of the best among the state in first responders. First responders will save lives faster than anybody else. If you have an AED, especially if someone has a heart attack, if you hook them up to an AED and the AED shocks, 80% of them live within the first five minutes. That's what the police officers give us. If we bring in county, county does not require any of their people to be EMTs. So we will lose that. And Cape Elizabeth Rescue will start becoming the whipping boy of Southern Maine EMS. And I will tell you this, the last people that became the whipping boy of Southern Maine EMS were Yarmouth and Cumberland. And when Yarmouth and Cumberland became the whipping boy, they had to go hire a full-time paramedic to be there all day long. And that would be a very large expense. They had to outfit these people, they had to outfit their truck, and it costs 
I don't know how much it would cost for a full-time medic, but I bet you it would probably be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I beat him here. Um, I was watching this on TV. We were about to head out and get some groceries and decided I had to come down and say something instead. Glad you did. Um, I have to tell you, I... I you I have several David, David, could you introduce yourself? Say who yourself? you are, even though we, we all know who you know are. Who you are. <laughs> they don't know. Who I am you David are. Hellman, uh, 22 Cranbrook Drive in Cape Elizabeth. I'm here as a citizen, but I'm also a member of the school board. Um, quite frankly, um, I have looked at the metrics for the, for the municipal side as well as the school side. I've looked at what our costs are. I've looked at our police department. I've looked at our fire department. And I have to tell you, what isn't broke, don't try and fix it. It's simple as that. Don't hire a consultant. I've hired 30 consultants in my 35-year practice. I've cross-examined another 35. A consultant will come in, charge you a fortune, will find something to change to justify their existence. Just like this consultant did in Portland. That was the, if you read it, that was the biggest piece of junk I've ever read in my life. It was filled with hearsay, based on no evidence, made recommendations that had no uh, correlation to the data. They admitted they had no data, yet they charged $40,000 and recommended they lay off 80 people. I mean, they must have picked that out of, a, out of a, a hat. You don't need consultants. This is a small town. We have metrics we compare with other towns. Uh, our schools, our fire department, the municipal department all match up well. In fact, we deliver services cheaper, and as far as I'm concerned, better than all the municipalities. That's all you need to know. Consolidation, for consolidation's sake, has been proven wrong. Throughout the 80s and 90s, all these me mega, mega consolidations by corporations proved to be more costly, did not save jobs, generated more jobs, and became more wasteful. Consolidation does not save. Generally, it generates more um, jobs and more costs. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Davis. I live at 23 Stone Drive in South Portland, and I am a 32-plus year member of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department at Engine One Station. Uh, in my 32 years working with the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department, um, I've enjoyed my service to the town. I worked as a public work and works employee for eight years here, here also. Uh, you have some of the finest people in the state working for you already. Um, a couple of points I want to make to you. Uh, to begin with, to start out to be a fireman in the town of Cape Elizabeth, you have to put in 80 hours free. And after that, they give you $10 an hour. If there's anybody here who isn't on the fire department already who wants to sign up for that, put your hands up, I'll get your names. Because we're, we're looking for more help. I have over 1,000 hours of training. I have pretty much every certificate that you can have. Uh, I am the Dorian uh, trainer for the town of Cape Elizabeth. It's a training method using visual, um, audio-visual methods the town is invested in. I am the guy who does all the driver training at Engine 1. I do the very, very simple pumped training. Everybody starts with me. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was, and Ron alluded to this, that um, we at Engine 1 are, are pretty happy where we are. I belonged in, in South Portland for 10 years, and I want to echo Ron's sentiment that I'm really not looking forward to going back. As a matter of fact, I'm not going back. Uh, a wise old guy that I once worked for, named William Jordan, up on Wells Road, he's a cabbage lettuce farmer. Uh, if any of you don't know him, you can ask Councillor Jordan, she knew him pretty well. <laughs> Said to me one day as we were uh, fixing the uh, tillers, for the, uh, um, the uh, uh, cultivators going back and forth in the field, he said to me, Mike, I think we got her pretty good. I don't think we want to adjust her anymore. And I think if he was here tonight, he would say to you, folks, let's not adjust this anymore. Thank you. Thank you. There is no one sitting in the queue. <coughs> That being the case, if there is no other public comment, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the public session. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? All in favor?
This meeting's adjourned. Uh, could, I just, could I just add one thing? For those of you who want to write us a comment, you're certainly welcome to do so. And Glenn, are you fielding, are you the initial recipient of these emails? I, I have been for the last several days. Um, Mike, how, how, what's the best way? What's the best way to, to receive email uh, comments, reports? Uh, we'll set up something online that, that sets up the direct email. People wait until noon tomorrow. We'll have it set up by then. Okay. okay. Uh, there'll be a contact with the committee that will automatically go along. We're also listed um, on the website, so if you want to chew any of our ears off, you may, uh, you may do that as well. Thank you so much. This committee really appreciates your input.